the limits of the Serengeti, a point only 200 miles from the end of their journey. They have already had to walk and gallop almost a thousand circuitous miles to reach this point. And as they go, the vultures go with them, overhead silently, watching and waiting. Food for themselves, food for others. That is the theme of the herds as they cross the land. But it's a movable feast. The lions, for example, can only feed on the herd when it travels through their territory. The vultures have the freedom of the air, where there are no territories. And so wherever the herds go, they go, cruising effortlessly on the thermals, up and then down. One of the commonest is the Ruppel's griffon, and all of them nest and roost on these cliffs in the southeast corner of the Serengeti. Every morning, once the sun has touched the plain and there is warm air rising to meet them, they launch themselves out and away to spend the day cruising over the herds. Sometimes they may ride the thermals for as far as 200 miles a day, there and back. It depends where the herds are. But wherever they are, the vultures will find them. Another dead wildebeest has served its purpose. But even after the vultures and other scavengers have finished, there is still another creature that lives off the dead. A small moth, the first cousin of the ordinary clothes moth, lays its eggs on the horns. And inside the dark horn material, the cycle takes place. The eggs turn into caterpillars, which burrow into the horn, and there they feed. In the course of time, it reappears on the surface and starts to shed its skin, and so, out of the dead horn comes a new life. But all this has been happening in the one that was left behind. The herds themselves are already miles away. across the north now, where there are more trees, thicker bush, a new kind of country and a new kind of predator. The leopard likes to take its kill up a tree for safety. At least, that's what it likes to do. But although the leopard, like the cheetah, only preys on calves, these are nearly a year old now and are getting a bit big. So he drags it off, disembowels it, and then comes back for a second attempt. If he doesn't get it up, there's a good chance hyenas or a lion will steal it. So he eats some, and then late that evening comes back for a third and final try. Now, safe from scavengers, it'll last him a few days. Then he'll return to the herd for another, for as long as the wildebeest stay in his territory. But that won't be for much longer. October has gone, and out on the plains where the wild dogs have been existing on the few gazelle that never leave, there is a sign of hope. For them and for the wildebeest and for all the other creatures that are parched and dry, the rains have come. 
and life can start again. Down in the south, the plains are green, the water holes full, waiting for the return of the herds. There is grass in plenty for them up here in the north too, but now that everywhere is green, they prefer the shorter species that grow on the plains. And the open plains with no cover for predators are a safe place for the calves that are soon to be born. Another more immediate reason for moving is that these northern areas get just too much rain. The land becomes flooded and waterlogged, and the wildebeest, if they stayed, would soon get foot rot. And so, slipping and sliding, they swing south on the last leg of their march, the move back to the plains. But they don't go back in the same great herds in which they left. Instead, they split up into long, straggling lines, as they make their way south. But one thing stays the same. They still cover much of the ground at a run. And the road to the plains is paved with gold. Their journey is by no means over, but now that they have reached the open country, they're much more relaxed. No more the milling, tight-packed, rolling-eyed herds that race through the bush country. Here, on the rich volcanic plains, they can spread out and graze. There are more obstacles ahead, but the pace is slower now, and there is time to put back the weight lost in the long, dry season. But for some, it is their last journey. This one is suffering from turning disease. A species of bot fly lays its eggs in the wildebeest's nostrils. Usually the maggots are sneezed out onto the ground, but sometimes one travels upwards and into the animal's brain. And there it upsets the animal's sense of balance. So the wildebeest starts to walk in circles and carries on walking until it dies. Sometimes they run instead, trying frantically to keep their balance. It makes no difference, and the end is always the same.
The hyenas have already marked him out. Whenever there is a creature behaving strangely on the plains, there are always other animals alert to wonder why. While it can, the wildebeest will fight, but the hyenas are in no hurry. When there are enough of them, they will make their move. A snarling, savage death, but perhaps a better one than turning slowly in circles until you can turn no more. And for every wildebeest that dies, others are being born. Born in the open, where it can easily be spotted by predators, the calf has only minutes to get to its feet and learn to run. Within five minutes, it can stand. And in less than 15, it can run as fast as its mother. This one is going to be safe. And because it is the firstborn of the year, the herd comes to inspect it. Soon the novelty will wear off, as it tends to, when you have a quarter of a million children a year. For the wildebeest, safety is numbers. Giving birth, they are alone. and in more danger than at any other time in their lives. They seem to know it, and so do others. But the predators aren't the main cause of death among the small calves. Most of them die simply because they get lost it happens all too easily when a huge herd stampedes and the last calf, desperate for company, tries to find it wherever it can. But everyone's hand is against him, not just the gazelles. Even another wildebeest who has lost her calf will chase off one that's not her own. But just sometimes, a miracle happens. Hope for a moment, but a false hope. She isn't the mother either. But then, incredibly, among all those animals, and after all that random chasing around, all those square miles of plain, literally by chance in a million,